All right, thank you, James. All right, everyone. Our presenter is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service Anchorage Forecast Office. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography from Ohio State University and a Master of Science in Science Management from UAA. Although she has 14 years of experience forecasting Alaska weather, she, it still manages to surprise her on a routine basis from time to time. Ladies and gentlemen, Louise Fodi. Thank you very much. So uh, nobody told me that I was going to have to follow the robot group when I came in here. I'm sorry to say I don't have any robots to show you, uh, but hopefully you will find the imagery that I put in my presentation pretty interesting. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, how we look at the weather, not so much on the actual process of, of how we go through thinking about it, but more at the tools we use to look at the weather, because we actually have a lot of really cool re remote sensing capabilities, and um, that's where we're, we're going to focus the talk today. So I'm kind of an observations nerd. I really like to look at the weather that's actually happening. We have other folks who are meteorologists who are more of modeling nerds. They like to go in and program the computers. But I like to see what's actually happening out there. So I'm going to talk about why observations are important when we write our forecast, uh, the different tools that we use. And this is where we're going to show a lot of the uh, pictures that I've put in here. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the human factor. So one thing that comes up a lot is, you know, with modern technology, will, will there be a time where there's no use for a human meteorologist? And I can't promise you that wouldn't eventually be the case, but as far as I'm concerned, I think we're always going to be needed because machines can't reproduce what humans are able to do. So we actually do use folks like you to help us write the forecast, and I'll talk about how you can be involved in being a meteorologist as well. I did want to mention, so there is a picture on this slide that I don't have later in the slideshow, and I wanted to point this out. This middle picture right here with the black and white imagery, we actually have something uh, called Carmen vortices in this slideshow. So um, this is what happens whenever you have strong winds that are flowing across islands in the water. And uh, I'm going to step over here and show you for a second. I'm not used to having a mic like this. So right here um, in the middle, we have these kind of spinning clouds. And basically what's happening here is the uh, winds are coming through the Aleutian Islands, and they actually make rotations within the cloud field. And that's something that we can see from satellite and uh, something that actually is not all that common. Uh, this one in particular, to have so many of those is pretty cool. So why am I qualified to talk to you about weather? Well, as mentioned, I got my uh, bachelor's degree from The Ohio State University. Go Bucks! <laughs> I came up here in 2000 as a lieutenant in the United States Air Force, and I was a meteorologist. And uh, that's me, young and happy and full of vim and vigor. After I got out of the Air Force, um, the Air Force was a lovely start to my career, long term, not for me. Um, I joined the National Weather Service, and I had a really awesome opportunity to become something called an incident meteorologist. And incident meteorologists are actually deployed out to, in particular, wildfires, although we might be deployed out to other events like hazmat spills, um, oil spills. Sometimes incident meteorologists are deployed in support of things like post-Hurricane Katrina cleanup. But uh, this is a picture um, when I was out working on one of the fires and we're taking a look at, um, I had just launched a weather balloon and we were tracking it through the atmosphere. And that was a super exciting part of my job. Sorry, I'm a little cold in here, so. No, nobody warned me that it was gonna be freezing. I should have worn a different, different shirt. So after, um, after I stayed in Alaska for a while, I got kind of tired of it. 
I'm really tempted for the jacket. <laughs> All right, that already feels better. <laughs> so um, I decided I wanted to go someplace new, and I actually got an opportunity to go work for the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, and that was super cool. The weather there um, is actually what I call upside down and backwards. So not only did I have to learn how to look at everything spinning the opposite direction, but I had to learn that cold air comes from the south, not the north. It was super challenging and a lot of fun. Yes. And uh, here I am at our forecasting computers. And I wanted to show this picture because this is very similar to what things look like in our office here in Anchorage as well with the multiple screens and we're looking at all different kinds of information at one time. So then I came back to Alaska and I became a warning coordination meteorologist. And what that means, I do write the forecast on t from time to time, but I also go out and I help people like emergency managers do planning for when they have severe weather events. So I'm working here I'm working with uh, the uh, fire chief down in Kodiak. We're putting together um, plans for in case there's a tsunami because we are also responsible for helping emergency managers plan to respond to things like tsunamis. It's a really exciting part of my job and I absolutely love it. I also spend a lot of time out in the mountains. I'm not by any means like an awesome skier or hiker, but I love it. And here's the thing that really makes me qualified to talk to you about weather is the fact that I'm a total weather nerd. And these are some pictures that I have on my Facebook just talking about the weather. This one, I actually made a cloud in my house that uh, it was not intentional, but the heat was out and I took a shower and the uh, heat came out of my shower and formed a cloud in my bedroom and I was so excited about this. <laughs> my friends thought my bedroom was on fire and that I was crazy. Crazy, yes, bedroom on fire, no. Um, this is a picture uh, that I took up in the mountains. It's something called a glory, and there's another, you know, not cool name for it. But uh, basically, you can see that rainbow around my head. We're looking down into the clouds. Uh, you can actually see this as well if you fly in airplanes a lot. When you look down from the airplane, it's not as frequent to see it when you're on the ground because you know how often are you like above the clouds with the sun still shining down on you. So cool thing about this, uh, they think actually that these types of phenomenon are um, what people observe when they think that aliens are coming to get them and stuff like that. So I took a picture of that. This one, I, my boss actually gave me a hard time about this one when I put it on Facebook because it was so nerdy. Um, this is the house across the street from me and you can see that most of the uh, roof there is clear of frost, except where the shade is, the frost is still there. And so I was like, oh, this is so cool. It's a perfect example of microclimates and how in the shade, the frost won't go away. And my boss was like, man, you really are a dork. No <laughs> dork. And here's the last one, which is, of course is uh, our beautiful uh, wave clouds that we get outside. Uh, we call these alto cumulus standing lenticular, um, or ACSL for short. Uh, one of my personal points of pride in my previous marriage was that by the time uh, we were towards the end of the relationship, my ex-husband was actually calling these ACSL and noticing when they were out uh, in the, the area, and so I, was, I felt like I had, you know, made a difference in the world there. <laughs> So, why are observations important? I mean, we can model all this stuff with computers, right? Well, our modern forecasting techniques are basically using math to describe the actions of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is basically a fluid, so in spite of the fact that it's air and not water, um, as you can see from this image, and I don't know if you guys can tell that it's actually moving, but uh, the air responds in a very similar way to like a tub, a bathtub would, if you spun it around, for example. 
So we use a lot of thermodynamics and a lot of fluid dynamics to describe what's going on in the atmosphere. And if you had asked me when I was a kid if I would end up in a career field where we basically had as much, as much math as an engineer, I would have said no way because I totally hate math. It is not my thing. So the good news is the computers do all the math for me. Um, and we have these really powerful supercomputers that run what we call numerical forecasting models. And they rely on initial conditions to simulate the outcome of the weather. So what are initial conditions? Those are our observations. Those are what we are looking at in the weather right now. So how accurate those observations are and how many of them there are really makes a difference in all these different model solutions. Plus, we use those observations to confirm or contradict what's happening in the different models. So I wanted to show you an example here. We have a lot more than four models, but here's the four main models that we like to look at. And uh, this black image with the different color lines is our mean sea level pressure. So in other words, uh, we're kind of looking where the low pressure centers are. And if there was one clear answer, we would see all the L's in the same place and all those lines would be in the same place. But instead what we have here is what we call a spaghetti map because it basically looks like you took spaghetti and threw it on the wall. And so what that means is that we actually don't really know which solution is correct. So going back to will meteorologists ever be not needed, I don't think so and this is why. How do you know which solution is correct? How is a computer going to be able to tell you? It gave you four solutions to start with. So we use those observations to look at the answers that the computer models give us and confirm or deny whether they're correct or not. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. You can pick one model and it's like way off in left field and we always say, oh, that guy's out to lunch. But other times, like this scenario, we have these low pressure centers that are pretty close together, um, but not far enough apart to make it really different. Now, depending on where those low pressure centers move can make a huge difference in the weather for wherever they're going. So in this case, up towards the panhandle. So we use observations, again, to support or deny what's going on. So let's start with satellites. I, uh, I have to admit, when I helped write the quiz, I thought you guys were going to be taking the quiz during the presentation, so I don't know. Um, but there's basically two main satellites for weather forecasting that we use. And one is our geostationary orbit, or the GOES satellites, and the other is the polar orbiting satellites. So as you can see, the geostationary satellite sits out here from Earth really far. And um, basically, it is far enough from Earth that as it rotates the Earth, it rotates the exact same speed that the Earth rotates. So what this ends up appearing like is that it's sitting over the same place in, on the Earth all the time. So we get a continuous image of one part of the Earth. And there's actually a whole bunch of these owned by different countries. Um, and also we have two main ones in the United States. And we just launched a new one, in fact, and uh, we're all pretty excited about the new imagery that's going to come from uh, Goes East. The second type of satellite is the polar orbiting satellite. And those go around the top of the Earth. They're much closer to the Earth, so they actually have higher resolution imagery. But because they go around the top of the Earth, they're looking at new things every day. So we can't have a loop of the imagery like we can with the geostationary but we can see things in more detail, and we can also get a different resolution for some of the items that we're looking at, and uh, I have some images to show that too. So the three main types of imagery that we use, this was in your quiz, is uh, visible imagery, infrared imagery, and water vapor. Starting with visible imagery, 
Um, this displays images in the visible light spectrum. So all of our satellite is measuring um, the electromagnetic spectrum and it, the visible one is basically taking a photograph of the Earth. So what this tells us is actually it does show true color for us. Um, it also tells us the density of the clouds. So where it's really white, the clouds are really dense. This is a really good example of a visible satellite image. So I don't know if you all have been following uh, the volcanic eruption that's going on out in the, in the Aleutians. Um, I think at the moment it's actually quiet again. But there is a volcano underneath the surface of the water just north of um, Alaska. And in this image you can see there's that brown ash cloud that's coming up out of the white uh, water vapor clouds. So we were actually able to see with satellite that this was erupting. And the black portion there is actually the shadow of the ash cloud as it rises above the water vapor clouds. This is really important because a lot of the volcanoes, we actually don't have ways to monitor them other than using satellite or lightning detection. Uh, so a lot of times we won't even know about a volcanic eruption until we see it on satellite. And this is one of them. So moving on to infrared. Infrared satellite imagery is measuring the temperature of features on the Earth. So it uses the infrared spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, we use that to figure out what the cloud heights are. So in other words, by telling how cold a cloud is and then comparing it to the temperature profile of the atmosphere, we can tell how high it is. It also tells us things about surface coverage. Um, infrared satellites are used for things like detecting fires. They're looking at uh, things like vegetation cover on the earth, how much moisture is in the soil. So there's a lot of different things that we can use it for. Um, in our case, it tells us a lot about uh, what kinds of clouds and how high they are. When clouds are very cold, uh, usually it means they're developing really quickly. And so uh, that's how we figure out the development of the system. Yes? I was going to ask you if you could tell us how high this volcano um, is. Actually, no. And the reason for that is we have all these different scales. And so the colors, so normally at my office I'd be able to tell you what this color scale is, but here I can't tell you. So we also, Frankly, I'll just I cheat. I use the uh, mouse to run over the temperature, and it, it gives me a readout. <laughs> yes. uh, follow-up question. So is cloud height necessarily directly related to the amount of precipitation that's happening below? No, it's not. That's a good question. So cloud height, um, there can be a lot of different clouds um, at different layers of the atmosphere. For example, a cirrus cloud, which is a very high cloud, they will show up as very cold, and so they're very, therefore very bright. In this case, they probably, um, some of those blue clouds and the pink clouds are cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds don't necessarily have a lot of precipitation with them. For example, if they are in kind of a a nice weather pattern. You can see the cirrus clouds up in the sky. They look like uh, what you call mare's tails, but there's nothing coming out of them. So we kind of have to use these features together. So if I looked on the infrared and I saw some high clouds that were very cold and they were very bright colored, and then I looked at the visible satellite imagery and I could see right through the clouds, what that would tell me is that the clouds were very cold, but they were very thin. So in other words, we're looking at kind of just uh, fair weather type cirrus versus if you have a thunderstorm, for example, um, they would also show up as very cold because a thunderstorm grows through the atmosphere and it hits those really cold temperatures in the top. When you look at a thunderstorm on a visible satellite image, it's also going to be very white because it's a, a really thick cloud. So you can see the development on both types of satellite imagery. And um, you can kind of marry them up that way. Now, 
after you've gotten experience for a while, you can look at an infrared picture and not look at a visible one and be able to tell things like a thunderstorm. But um, it, it takes a little while if you're not used to looking at those sorts of features. One thing about infrared that's really helpful up here in particular is that we can see it all the time. Visible, obviously, we can't see anything at night. So here's an example um, that we put together for one of our major systems. I forget which one this was. I think it was, I think it was one of the, the record systems that came out of Japan. Um, but it was a really, really strong system. So uh, 929 millibars, that's the central pressure. That's very, very low. It's lower than most hurricanes. Um, and you can see all that red. That's your cirrus clouds. Those are your high cold clouds. And then down here, this section is actually dark gray. These are warmer clouds. They're much lower clouds. But looking at this, I can actually analyze where the jets are flowing because I know how to analyze the satellite imagery. So we have what's called a sting jet, which is a area of really strong winds. And uh, it was moving down toward the surface and it was supporting some really strong winds at the surface. And uh, we measured 122 miles an hour at ADAC, I believe. So the last kind of satellite imagery that we use all the time is called water vapor. And water vapor measures wavelengths between 6.7 and 7.3 microns. And what that is is the, um, it's the uh, area of the electromagnetic spectrum that is absorbed and re-radiated by water vapor. So what this tells us um, is how much water vapor is in the air. And by knowing that, we can know whether the air is rising or sinking, because rising air has a lot of water vapor in it. Sinking air actually does not. It's drying as it sinks. So that tells us a lot about storm development or high pressure. Um, this also tells us a lot about atmospheric motion. And I just wanted to point out, so we have in this satellite image, the green thing over here on the right is a fully developed weather system. So it's already past its prime. At this point, it's probably starting to weaken. Down here on the left, there's kind of this blob of bluish, whitish clouds. This is actually what we call a baroclinic leaf. And that's a satellite signature that indicates a new storm system is developing. So here we're looking at one storm system that's probably pretty much done and then another one on its heels that's going to come up, move into the Aleutians, and redevelop very similar to the one on the right. Yeah. Yes? So is that indication because of the collision of what appears to be two different temperatures? The, uh, the higher and the colder? The blue and the red? So actually, this is, this is not temperature-based, unlike the infrared. Um, what this tells me is that there's a lot more water vapor in this area. This area is dry down here. Um, but again, we have to kind of learn how to analyze these satellite images. Uh, there's a jet coming up here. Um, an upper level kind of jet stream is probably, I don't know, I'm trying to think here. I, I think about it in millibars, which is so not helpful for you guys. Um, but it's a... <laughs> It's at the 300 millibar area in the upper atmosphere. So basically about the level of your jet planes. And um, the, it's a river of air that's bringing up warm, moist air from down south and developing the storm system here. There's actually probably a low pressure system developing right here that's eventually going to look like that. So we can use satellite for a lot of other cool things too. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about what's called atmospheric rivers. And what that is is an area that has a lot of moisture in it that's moving into um, one area or another. So you can see these kind of blue stripes coming up. 
That would be indicative of what we call an atmospheric river, um, and it usually has a lot of precipitation in it. This image is something we call total precipitable water. And what that is is the satellite actually measures the water that's in the atmosphere, and it does an integral to calculate the total amount of water from the surface all the way to basically outer space. And it tells us how much water is able to come out of the atmosphere. Down here in the tropics, it's really, really moist. Up here towards the poles, it's quite a bit drier. So when you see these blue tongues coming up towards the poles, that means there's a lot more moisture coming up. It's when we have a really high rain events that cause flooding down in Seward, for example. Those are caused by atmospheric rivers. This is what we call a false color image. And it's called false color because we have put these colors on here. The land is not really blue and the clouds aren't really pink. It helps us highlight different things that we're looking at. So here we actually have some sea ice. There's some dust coming out of gaps. It's a little harder to see from the back probably, but there's some stripes coming out here. And then we have the higher level clouds that we've dyed in paint to help kind of point these things out. Another thing that we have on our satellites is called synthetic aperture radar, SAR imagery. And what this does is it actually measures the roughness, the surface roughness of the water. So we're talking about waves here. And it's able to detect how strong the winds are blowing. In this case, we had a really strong wind event from the northwest. This is Kodiak Island. And uh, the, the red areas are actually above 40 knots of wind. So we're thinking storm force winds for those of you who are mariners. Now, it's a little bit limited. Basically, once it gets to red, that's all we know. So we can't tell whether it's 80 or 45. But it does help us image what's going on with the winds. I mentioned volcanic eruptions before. But satellite's a huge tool for that, because again, we can't tell a lot of times when these volcanoes erupt. And we can actually track uh, the sulfuric dioxide that comes out of the volcanoes and um, track that around the world, which is really important because if those clouds are containing ash, it can actually cause planes to crash. So anytime you have a volcanic eruption, we actually have to track these ash clouds until they dissipate so that pilots know, know not to fly through them. So a couple more things. This one over here on the left is our sea ice analysis group. And we're very lucky in Alaska. We actually have people who focus on analyzing sea ice both in Cook Inlet and up towards the Northwest. In this case, we were very close to the Iditarod. And although we don't do a specific Iditarod forecast, of course, we're all very interested in what's going to happen. The Iditarod, the Iditarod was about to go from Shatulik up here through Quake. And uh, these dark areas are actually open water. So here you can see ice. There's ice over here. And these are what we call po polinias, so areas of open water. And we were watching it very closely because if those moved into where the Iditarod was, obviously this would be a big threat to, to the dog teams. Fortunately, they were safe. This was from a couple years ago. And the last thing I wanted to show, this is one of my favorites. Um, I mentioned how we look at different channels in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we look at the visible spectrum, we look at the um, water vapor, we have uh, infrared. By doing what we call channel subtraction, which is literally what it sounds like, they take the data from one and subtract the data from another, we can actually highlight different areas of clouds in the satellite imagery. In this case, we have some fog. It looks kind of like um, it looks kind of like terrain because that's basically what it is. The fog is in a low area of terrain and it's going up here in the rivers. So again, another really cool thing that we're able to use. So do you guys actually No. <laughs> so um, the Iditarod is a private agency, and uh, 
there is a bit of a conflict of interest there, but what we can do is keep an eye on it and emergency management agencies that are involved with the UID abroad can pass along that information. So it's not that we don't care. It's that we're, we try to find line between public service and uh, not uh, treading on private industry's toes. As I mentioned before, we often have to pair our observation tools. In this case, we this is the Funny River Fire from 2014. We have the satellite image that shows the smoke. And then we're also able to see it on radar. So in other words, this big plume coming down is from the Funny River Fire. And I brought that one up because I wanted to move into talking about radar. So radar actually uses radio waves to detect objects. Um, in our case, it's precipitation, but you can see other things. For example, the fires. Uh, we can see volcanic eruptions, which is why our radar is actually in Kenai instead of in Anchorage, because it was put there to be able to detect volcanic eruptions down um, in the Alaska range. We use Doppler radar to detect storm motion. I'll explain how that works in a second. We have um, algorithms that help tell us how much it's raining or snowing. We are able to look at wind measurements by telling how the precipitation is moving. And then finally, in recent years, we've developed something new called dual pole radar that I'll talk about in a second too. And it tells us how big and what shape the droplets are, and that's really important for letting us know whether it's rain or snow or ice or, or what is in those clouds. So how does Doppler radar work? Well, basically when we send out a pulse of, um, pulse of energy, like I said, it, it's a pulse, it's not an individual electron, it's actually a wavelength. And it goes out and it hits an object and then it comes back to the radar, and that's how we know that there's an object out there. Well, if the object is moving, it actually changes the wavelength of this energy that we send out. If it's moving towards you, the wavelength gets shorter. If it's moving away, the wavelength gets longer. This is the same kind of Doppler imagery that they use in astronomy. In fact, that's where it was developed. So by detecting the changes in the wavelength, the radar tells us how the precipitation is moving. And this will tell us actually a lot about this, the shape of the storm clouds and how they're developing and whether there's features like tornadoes in them. So I also mentioned the dual pole portion of the radar. That's short for dual polarization. We now send out the pulses in two different orientations. So there's one that goes back and forth like this and then there's one that goes up and down like this. And by detecting the change in the shape of the wavelength as it comes back, the radar is able to tell us a lot about the shape of the water droplet, and that tells us whether it's rain or snow, among other things. So this is some of the stuff that we're able to do now. It's actually pretty cool. Um, if you look at old radar imagery with the scope, it's like a whole nother world. I don't know how those guys looked at weather at all. Um, we don't get a lot of tornadoes up here. We don't get a lot of tornadoes in the radar area. So I stole some imagery from Alabama. <laughs> and what we're looking at here is the 3D view. And this is, this is based on data. This is not um, a computer imagined tornado. This is what we were measuring. And you can see that right here, there's this red funnel that comes down. That's actually the tornado. We're seeing the tornado on the ground by using radar imagery. So with the 2D version, um, we have this, what we call a hook. That purple bit is called a debris ball. And what that is, is it's actually showing where the debris is coming out of the tornado. Because as you might imagine, since the radar is hitting different objects and coming back, when you have things like houses and cows flying around in the air, it sends a lot of energy back. <laughs> yes, this was a huge event. And, um, 
it actually there's a lot of really good imagery from it. This is one of those things where it's kind of you have, you have to be careful as a meteorologist because you see things like this and it's like, oh, cool, look at all these great tornadoes. Well, you know, these are people's houses and lives that are at, that are at risk here. So, you know, we we have to be careful and, and not try not to get too excited about things that are possibly going to kill people. So talking a little bit more about automated observing stations, we have a lot of things out there that are automated. Um, we have uh, things that we put at airports, so um, what's called an ASOS, which stands for Automated Service Observing Station. Um, we have buoys out in the water that measure wind and waves. We use river gauges a lot, in particular um, on some of the larger rivers here in Alaska. We have precipitation gauges and snowfall gauges. If any of you are backcountry skiers, you might have heard of a snow tell. Those are frequently on top of the mountains measuring snowfall. We even have something called the Mesonet, which is where people who have personal weather stations will sign up for an ID and it goes into um, it goes into a database and we can actually look at people's personal weather stations around Anchorage. And that helps us out. You have to be a little careful because sometimes people do things like install their station you know next to a brick wall and so the temperature is 10 degrees higher than it is anywhere else but it's still really useful information but here's what automated stations can't do and that's show us what's actually happening so what we have here is one of our ACSL our alto cumulus standing lenticular for pilots there's actually a rotor cloud down here at the bottom these are really cool clouds um, they also have a lot of turbulence in them They're pretty dangerous for pilots so we love to see those sorts of things an automated station can't tell us about that so we use humans a lot we have weather balloons that we launch um, we actually do some augmentation, augmentation of our automated stations. Again, with the, the river gauges, we have people out there who are literally measuring how far the river goes up on a pylon or something. Then we have some volunteer observing programs I'm going to talk about. And also, we do a lot of crowdsourcing with social media these days. A big program um, that is really helpful for us is our co-op program. This is kind of a big time commitment for folks um, because you have to be at home taking an observation every day at the same time. So we have a lot of people who are super weather nerds or who are elderly or sometimes organizations like firehouses who are always there will be co-op observers. But this information goes into our climate database and it's really important for telling us how the weather is changing in different areas, in particular up here in Alaska where we don't have a long weather record. We also have something called Kokoraz. It hasn't taken off in Alaska the way it has in the lower 48, but these are just folks who go out and they measure precipitation. So we're talking about rain and snow, and they submit their observations online. And again, it tells us a lot about how much rain is falling. One thing about radar, as you move further away from the radar, you actually look further and further up in the cloud. So you may not be able to see what's happening at the surface. Here in Anchorage, the radar beam is actually about 3,000 feet above the Earth. Doesn't see what's happening in between 3,000 feet and the surface. So there's times that you could get precipitation that you aren't even seeing it on the radar. So this really helps us out with those situations. Crowdsourcing and social media. Believe it or not, this is a huge help. So this is what we call tweet deck. We're literally just scanning people's tweets. And people will experience stuff, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, it's flooding out here, I'm going to tweet about it instead of actually going someplace safe. And uh, <laughs> they send out a tweet with a picture, and then we're like, oh great, we should have a warning out. <laughs> but people love to share their bad experiences, so this, this came from Facebook. Um, we had somebody email in some picture of freezing spray which is pretty dangerous um, out in the, uh, in the um, Bering Sea. Freezing spray is another thing that we can't measure with 
our buoys. It's something that we have to find out about from mariners. And we do have a Facebook page. I encourage you to follow it. We post a lot about weather forecasts in addition to sometimes we do kind of nerdy posts and we also enjoy getting your images as well. So citizen science is kind of a new term that's been coming up and there's a lot of different citizen science agencies out there. Um, it's an opportunity for the public to be involved in whatever kind of science. So in this case, the LEO network, the Local Environmental Observer Network, um, are just folks who are noticing things in their area that's different. They might notice new plants growing or um, fish with a lot of disease or something like that. And they go on there and they, they share this information and scientists are able to look at that and look at pictures and kind of figure out what's going on with the environment. So we do get some weather observations from that. Um, the, NASA is actually doing a citizen science program where they're looking for um, snow observations in Thompson Pass to be able to use that information for avalanche forecasting. Uh, this thing in the middle called the Sea Ice for Walrus Outlook is a big program that we have with some of our native communities on the West Coast. So we're looking at where the sea ice is. They go out and they do uh, subsistence hunting and, and uh, give us observations and we give them forecasts. And it's a way to kind of share information because we aren't always able to get out where people are looking at things. But this actually kind of isn't a new thing for the Weather Service because we are always looking for spotter reports. So you can actually send us a weather report if you go to our webpage, which is just www.weather.gov slash Anchorage. There's a button down here on the bottom that says Submit Reports. And um, if you put your information in here, it, it will locate you. So if you use your phone or if you allow the location in your browser, it'll tell us a lot long where it is. And you can just put whatever you've observed. And there's even a section for you to type in information. So if you can't find what event type you're looking at, you can just type it in there. And um, there's voluntary contact information. If you put your your information in there, we may actually contact you. So, you know, sometimes we'll get observations. And what happens when people submit through this, it actually pops up on our computer, computer immediately. So we're able to see right now what's happening at your house. So sometimes people will submit things. They're like, oh, I got 12 inches of snow. And I'm like, what? And I call them and they're like, oh, I didn't know you were going to call me. I'm like, well, you put your information in there. So, it, it, but it's always fun to talk to people. I generally find that when people are submitting storm reports, they want to talk to you about the weather. And we certainly don't share that information with anyone. But if you are looking for an opportunity, we do have a training on becoming a volunteer weather spotter. You can always submit weather reports via our webpage, but if you're looking for an opportunity to call us more frequently to know how to best observe the weather to help us out, or um, you're willing to let us call you when we think the weather's going to be bad, I encourage you to sign up for this Weather Spotter training course. The next one is next weekend, and um, we do have a, a sign up on our Facebook page, or you can email Rebecca.Dual at noah.gov and we plan to have others in the future so if you can't make it this time we'll have another one again soon so i just wanted to say thanks to my coworkers because without them this would have been a lot more boring um, these folks helped me pull together all those beautiful images that you saw and uh, that's all i've got We've got time for a little Q&A here before we go over our trivia answers. So if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> go ahead. I'll show you back in the early 80s. They were actually launching weather rockets. Is that still a current technology or is that like way past? 
Um, so we don't do much with weather rockets these days. They used to have a launch facility on Kodiak, but that um, it blew up. A rocket blew up on the pad a couple years ago, and so they haven't uh, restarted that. Uh, most of our stuff is with balloons these days. Rockets are expensive. Yes? The weather forecast is so much better than it was some years ago, so I'll have to be planning. And I'm wondering if you have a judgment when you're planning days out, like three, five days, they have 10-day forecasts on weather.com. How much is kind of reliable? Um, so, me personally, I would say that probably out to three to four days is pretty good. Um, up here, our time is probably shorter than it is in the lower 48. So, if you were in Iowa, I might trust it out to five or six days. Here, I would trust it out to three or four. If there's a big change in the weather coming, it's probably going to be even a shorter time period than that because when the when the weather changes, it makes it really difficult to um, to tell what exactly what's going to happen. I don't put much stock in this 10 day 10 day forecast. I can tell you right now, if you see a forecast that's greater than 10 days, there's some out there for months and months in advance. That's all based on what we call climatology, which is averages. So, you know. The average will tell you something. I don't know how useful it is if you're planning your wedding. <laughs> yes? So, I, I uh, check the weather a lot. I don't know whether it's accurate or something. But uh, the, I noticed like, the local news channels don't even use NOAA weather for their forecasting. They use the same thing as weather underground. Or, uh, so, why, why are there differences in, in who uses a forecasting model? Even real short term forecasts is different between uh, different entities. Well, so first of all, if you get 10 meteorologists in a room and ask them what the forecast is going to be, you're going to get 10 different forecasts. Um, the, the Weather Underground actually is, um, they do have our data. So when they use Weather Underground information on TV, I'm not clear whether they're using our data or whether they use something um, that Weather Underground puts out called a Weather Underground Best Forecast. Uh, everybody likes to own their own um, forecast. So a lot of times the folks on TV will write their own forecast, and they're certainly you know, happy to do that. As I showed you with that slide with the multiple low pressure centers, picking the right solution it can be pretty difficult at times. So that's why you get a bunch of different forecasts. Um, we like to try to work with the media partners so we can have a similar message to go out, especially when there's a lot of dangerous weather happening. But like I said, people like to own their own forecasts, so um, they do their own thing. Does that answer your question? Sort of? It's kind of what I expected. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, so from what I understand, water vapor is more of a gas than CO2. No, the temperature on infrared is more a function of where the cloud is in the atmosphere. When you're talking about things like uh, greenhouse gases, water vapor actually absorbs radiation and then re-emits it, you know, re-emits it, basically. So where you would notice a difference then is things like a clear night versus a cloudy night. Clear night, the Earth radiates um, energy, it gets cold a lot more than on a cloudy night, where a cloudy night, not only is it bouncing off the clouds, but the clouds themselves are radiating, radiating energy too, so the cold air doesn't, it, so it doesn't cool as quickly on a cold night. So you don't see it as much with the thickness of the clouds and the temperature, because that really is more a function of the height. Does that, does that answer your question? Sort of? Okay. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I've lived in Anchorage a long time. Um, 
what is it about Anchorage's location that makes it appear to be so difficult to forecast precipitation, snow, rain, otherwise? It seems like we often get a forecast for large amounts of snow or large amounts of rain, and often it doesn't materialize. Is there something about the location of Anchorage that makes that happen? So the Chugach range actually really affects how much precipitation we get in Anchorage. And when we have um, weather that's coming in from the east, it comes over the mountains. And as it comes over the mountains, it actually dries as it comes across the mountains. And there will be what's called a rain shadow or um, a precipitation gap. Now, it doesn't just completely dry out all the way through the west coast. Um, so there will be a band at some point where the, the air is no longer dry because it's, it's kind of come off the mountains and continued on instead of coming back down. And where that band is, it depends a lot on how strong the winds are coming over the mountains. It also depends on the orientation of the winds. Predicting those things in advance can be very difficult. We have certain things that we look for on our computer models. The computer models always don't always have the orientation quite right. Also, we're kind of limited, in spite of all the tools that we have, we're kind of limited on knowing exactly how much moisture is in the atmosphere. So sometimes, even though we think it should be dry in Anchorage, it still manages to come across the mountains anyway. And that's when we can really bust a forecast. <laughs> Yes. So the, the clouds, so basically at night, um, the earth is radiating heat, but we're not getting any heat in, right? Because the sun's not shining. So we have a net loss of radiation. Now, if it's cloudy, the radiation doesn't go further out in the atmosphere. The clouds hold it in. So it'll stay warmer if it's cloudy than if it's, uh, if it's clear and cold. Yes. Okay, last one. Yep. No, we write all the tasks. Yeah. There's 17 in our area alone, and so we're responsible for all 17 tasks. It's actually a huge job. Okay, thank you. All right, I believe Louise should be here for a few more minutes after our presentation here is over. She can answer any more in-depth questions that you might have. Uh, we'd like to present her with our gifts at this time. Uh, the first is, of course, our Anchor Science Pub uh, lager glass. It has the uh, Anchor Science Pub logo on the front, and of course, the molecule for ethyl alcohol on the back. There you go. And of course, uh, the gift from the tap room, our $25 gift certificate for her as well. Right. And uh, thank you very much, Louise, and she will be here for a few more minutes after. But right now we have James with the conclusion of our exciting trivia.